Okay, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Let me read them to you. To the, church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, now, throughout the history of the church, um, and even in our own day today, uh, the purity and the strength of the persecuted church is apparent. Uh, I don't know if you heard the report on the news just the other day. There were some Christians that were killed. I think it was in the Middle East, Afghanistan, one of those countries. There's, there's still persecution that goes on in this world because people are Christians. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. Let me read to you what James says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And then also Peter says, and the God of all grace who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So we know that a church that suffers is a church that is purged. It's purged. You know, fake Christians, half-hearted Christians, they don't hang around a church that's being persecuted, okay? Now, 2,000 years ago, a little church in the city of Smyrna was just such a church, purified through suffering that comes from persecution. And again, let me just remind you, because we took last week off, um, as we go through these letters, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. These are real churches, they're real people, they're in real cities, but they're also types of churches, types of churches. And so this helps us understand churches today that are suffering under persecution, and it shows us how we should deal with suffering. And that's really what we're going to focus on, okay? Now, this is the second of seven letters in the book of Revelation to the churches in Asia Minor, which is now modern Turkey. Again, let me remind you that these letters are written by the Lord Jesus Christ through the pen of the Apostle John while he was exiled on the island of Patmos about 96 AD. They're all written to the angel or the angelos or the messenger of these individual churches, which we've learned is really the senior leadership of these, these individual churches. And I told you um, that um, uh, the, these, these, uh, these letters follow the postal route. I've always got some slides for you. Let's, let's put the first slide up. Okay, how about this, uh, the next one here? Go to the second. Okay, so I hope you can see that. <clears throat> we talked about Ephesus. Now we're going to Smyrna, okay? Now you see that? They're going to follow a postal route that a postal carrier would, would follow, okay? Smyrna is about 40 miles north of Ephesus. And it's just one of only two churches out of these seven where there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation that the Lord gives to this church. You recall in Ephesus, what was their condemnation? They lost their first love, right? Okay, not so with Smyrna. They have no condemnation here, okay? And it's clear because it's a purged church. It's a suffering church, okay? From an earthly standpoint, there is always... Uh, a price to pay for being a Christian, and that apparently was the case here uh, with this church, okay? Um, so in these verses, Christ has no condemnation for them. He only has praise. Let me give you a quick background, okay? Uh, Domitian is the emperor at this time of the Roman Empire. He was a murderous dictator who launched extensive persecutions against uh, Christians throughout the empire, particularly uh, in, in Smyrna at this time. So as again, as we look at this this letter and what Christ has to say, this church provides us a model of how a church should undergo persecution and suffering and also how individual Christians should. So let's take a look first as we follow our pattern. Let's take a look at the author. We know that the author is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the description, okay? Look what it says in verse 8. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. Now again, let me remind you that each of the descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ at the beginning of these particular letters is relevant to the particular situation that these churches are facing, okay? And, and so what we have here is the first and the last. 
He's described as the first and the last, okay? Well, what's that all about? Well, as I've told you prior to this, because this is the same description that comes out of chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, okay? These descriptions, again, are used. Uh, the first and the last refers to the, a title that God took in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, 44, verse, uh, verse 6, 48, verse 12, and so on, okay? Now this title is given to Jesus, so you see what's happening is Jesus Christ is taking on the same titles as God the Father in the Old Testament, which means that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God incarnate. That's just something that you should remember, okay? We also find this description in Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, all right? So he's the first. He existed before anything else existed. He is the last. He will go on forever. The point here is that Christ transcends space and time and creation, okay? As you know, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is God incarnate who entered into human history for the very purpose of dying for our sins. That's the heart of the gospel, okay? So the question is, why is Jesus describing himself this way to this church? And the answer is because of the persecutions that they are going to experience. Well, they've already been experiencing them, but what they're going to continue to experience in other words, Jesus is trying to say to them, look, I know it's going to get tough for you, okay? Uh, it's hard living in this world, okay? I know that. I, I was here before it started. I will be here when it's, a, when it's all done. I transcend all of this, and so will you if you stay faithful to me. Furthermore, I know about dying because I was dead, and yet I have come back to life. And if you stay faithful to me, the same thing is going to happen to you. So he reminds them that even if they should die in this persecution, they will not experience anything that he has not already experienced. And even if they should die, they will not be cut off from his resurrection power. You know the Lord Jesus Christ suffered the most unjust, severe, and powerful persecution that anyone has ever suffered in the history of humankind. He suffered death on a cross to bear the sins of the world. And now what he is saying is, I was dead and I came back to life, and if you remain faithful to me, the same thing will happen to you. Okay? So, the writer of the letter is the risen Lord Jesus Christ. John is just the amanuensis, just the, the secretary, if you will. All right, let's talk a little bit about the city, okay? Um, it's very interesting. Out of the seven cities that we're going to be looking at, Smyrna was the most beautiful. It was called the Crown of Asia, not only because of its magnificent architecture. Let's go to some other slides here real quick. Uh, there's some, some obviously, these are, these are ruins, but uh, there's some wonderful pillars here. Go to the next one. They had a lot of wonderful, beautiful archways, these stone archways throughout the city. And one more picture. Let's go to that. Okay, so we have, just want to give you a feel for what's going on. But it was beautiful not only because of the architecture, but also because of the topography. It was near the coast, but it was also near the mountains. No, no, not yet. Go back. Go back. You, 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 no, go back. Yes, stay right there. Okay, we'll get there. It seems that the city had been here for a very long time, thousands of years. We're not really sure when, when the city started. Okay, there were earthquakes and there were ruins, and they kept building upon that and building upon that. Um, the population of, uh, of Smyrna today, okay, go to the next slide. Um, this is Smyrna today. There's about 300,000 people that live here. It's called uh, Izmir, Turkey, and it's interesting. Remember when we talked about the, la the first letter to, to the, the church in Ephesus? What did, what did Christ say? If you're not faithful to me, I'm going to take your lampstand away. Ephesus doesn't exist today. There's no church existing in Ephesus today. Guess what? There is Smyrna today. It still exists, and there's still a Christian church that exists there today. Okay? So think about that as we, uh, we think about uh, being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it was quite a, 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 a place here. It had a harbor. Go to the next, uh, the next slide. This is a satellite view of the harbor of Smyrna. It actually goes in 35 miles inland, okay, which is quite unusual. Final slide. Go, go to the next one. And this, this shows you where the ancient city was that, in that yellow square, and then, and then the purple is where it, uh, where it goes on later, okay? Um, but it had a wonderful, wonderful harbor, all right? So it was also a center for science and medicine, and uh, Rome gave it the privilege of self-governing. Uh, but for our interest this morning, let's talk a little bit about Smyrna religiously. It was the center of emperor worship, of the emperor worship cult. In fact, they killed people in Smyrna who did not show allegiance to, uh, to Caesar. Every year, 
Every citizen in Smyrna had to burn incense to the altar of Caesar and get a certificate verifying that you did that. And if you did not do that, you could be subject to death. Now just think about this for a moment, folks, okay? Think about how compromising we are, right? They wouldn't mind if you worshipped other gods besides Caesar, right? I mean, they had a pantheon of gods, right? They have Aphrodite, they have, uh, they have Zeus, uh, they have Apollo, they have a whole bunch of gods. Listen, all we want you to do is we want you to burn some incense to Caesar. Now, m many of us today would probably say, yeah, sure, I'll do it because we know that, you know, Caesar is nothing. They wouldn't even do that. You know why? Because not only would they not worship Caesar or any other god, they only worship Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? So to compromise yourself to say, oh yeah, sure, okay, I'll just throw some incense on the altar, but I know that it's not real. They would not even do that under penalty of death. Now think about that. Think about that, okay? And how compromising we are, all right? <clears throat> Half a century after John writes this letter, there's a very famous, we call him a church father. His name was Polycarp. He was um, burned alive at the age of 86 in this town of Smyrna. There was also the goddess Sybil, who's the earth goddess. She had a temple there. Apollo had a temple, Aphrodite, Zeus. All of them had temples, OK? There was also a statue of, of Homer, who was supposedly born uh, in, in Smyrna. But nestled in this little uh, pagan community is the Christian church. So let's talk now about the church, all right? Well, we're not sure how it was founded. Interestingly, there's no mention of it in the book of Acts. The only thing that we know about this church is the few lines that we read from it right now in the book of Revelation. I think it's safe to assume that it was established during Paul's three years in Ephesus. Remember, we talked about that before. Acts chapter 19, verse 10 says that the word went out through Ephesus into all of Asia Minor as Paul was there for three years. It's probably the case that that's when this church was founded. Uh, but for this church, life was very dangerous, and it was dangerous for a number of reasons. Again, if you fail to acknowledge Caesar uh, as Lord, uh, you, could, you could lose your life. Um, historians tell us that there were mass executions of Christians in Smyrna who refused to bow the knee to Christ. And again, Caesar was worshipped as a god. He claimed to be deity. Now, something that I think is very interesting, and this is what I love about God's word, um, the word Smyrna is where we get the word myrrh, myrrh from, myrrh. Myrrh was a substance that was taken from a very thorny tree. You had to crush the tree in order to get the myrrh, the sap out of it, okay? It was a perfume. Later on, it was thrown on dead bodies because of the, because of the smell. We're not quite sure what that fragrance was like. But you'll remember that it's mentioned several times in the New Testament, right? You remember Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men, what do they bring? Gold, a gold, frankincense, and myrrh, shmyrna. That's where it comes from, okay? Um, it was brought as a perfume, okay? In Mark chapter 15, Christ was offered, a, uh, offered wine drink mixed with myrrh, with smyrna, okay? John chapter 19, Christ's body was covered with myrrh or smyrna. So what started out in the New Testament as a perfume gets to be associated with death. And what it is here for us is it's a picture of a suffering church. Do you understand that? As the tree is crushed, what does it do? It gives off this fragrance. As the church is crushed for Christ, what does it do? It gives off a beautiful fragrance. It's a wonderful, wonderful image, I think, of what is going on here in Smyrna, okay? Unlike Ephesus, there was no leaving their first love. Okay, folks, one of the things I want you to, 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 to realize, okay, the suffering that we go through in this life is either going to drive you into the open arms of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or it's going to drive you away from Christ, which is what Satan wants. That's what happens when we undergo suffering. It either draws us into a closer relationship with the Lord or we allow Satan to make it a barrier or a wedge between us and the Lord, okay? Now, let's talk about the, the commendation, the commendation. Look at verse 9. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, you remember back in chapter 1, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. He's walking among the lampstands. He's got eyes of fire. What's that, all, what's that vision about? 
uh, th that vision is about the fact that Christ sees everything. Nothing is, is exempt from his eyesight, okay? So what does he say here? I know your tribulations. I know your suffering, okay? I know what's going on in your church, okay? The, 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 these Christians were being persecuted. We talked a, a little bit about it, but again, number one, because of the emperor worship, for 300 years before this letter was written, way back in 1095 B.C., okay, Dia Rome, right, the god of Rome, Rome a god, actually a goddess, right, had been going on. The worship of Rome as a god had been going on for 300 years, okay. There had been a temple built in Smyrna uh, where you would go and you would worship to Rome. It became the center of Caesar worship in the empire here, okay? And again, as I mentioned, refusing to, to offer incense to the bust of the emperor uh, meant that you wouldn't get your certificate and you could, uh, you could be persecuted because you would be in rebellion against Rome. That's the way they looked at it. But number two, they were also surrounded, as I mentioned, by all these other pagan temples to Zeus, Aphrodite, Sybil. It just goes on and on and on. But notice the most severe problem. Look what he says in verse 9. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now let's make sure that we understand what Jesus is saying here, okay? The Jews hated the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They refused to acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay, so th this is really an unbelievable statement that Jesus makes here, okay? He's saying that the members of these, congr of these congregations here, <coughs> uh, of these, these synagogues, they're members of, of a synagogue. It's not a synagogue of God. It's a synagogue of Satan. What a statement that is that the Lord is saying here. Jews who had rejected the Messiah, who hated the church of Jesus Christ. By the way, Paul had been one of these Jews, right, when he went and persecuted Christians, okay? They now had a major problem, you see, that they had to deal with. They were part of an assembly. They had been part of an assembly of God, but with the coming of the Messiah, you have to listen to this, folks. With the coming of the Messiah and the rejection of Jews for Jesus Christ, Judaism becomes just as satanic as emperor worship. Do you understand that? Okay? That's what Jesus is saying. They are now a synagogue of Satan. Even worse than the other pagan worship rites, they had the truth. They had a history. And they rejected that with the coming of the Messiah. So they set out to slander Christians. You might not know this, but early Christians were accused of cannibalism. They drink the blood and they eat the flesh of Jesus Christ. They were, sl they, they were slandered for lust and immorality because they greet each other with a holy kiss. They were slandered for home wrecking because when one became a Christian, that would bring division into the home if the other spouse didn't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were slandered for atheism because they would not worship the pantheon of, of, of Greek gods, Roman gods. And not only that, they reported Christians to the Roman authorities so that they might be executed, all right? Now look at verse 9 again. It says, who say they are Jews and are not. Now that's very interesting. That poses a question. What is Jesus trying to say here? Are they Jews or aren't they Jews? And here's where Christians get very confused. So let me see if I can clear this up for you. Were they Jews ethnically and physically? The answer is yes, they were. They were biological descendants of Abraham. Were they Jews spiritually and from a faith standpoint? No, they were not. They were not spiritual descendants of Abraham. Who were the spiritual descendants of Abraham once Jesus Christ came? Christians. Christians are the spiritual descendants of Abraham not the Jews anymore, because they rejected God's Messiah, okay? They had once belonged to the synagogue of God, now they belong to the synagogue of Satan. Why? Because you're not just a Jew outwardly. Remember what Paul says in Romans 2, chapter 28 and 29, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. So physically and ethnically, they were Jewish. Spiritually, they were just as pagan as the people who were worshiping the emperor. 
okay? And so the, the, the Christians here are being slandered by them. Listen, it, it should be no great revelation that, that the Jews hated the Christians. I mean, all you have to do is read the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 50, you see their hatred in Antioch. Acts chapter 14, verses 2 through 5, you see their hatred in Iconium. Acts chapter 14, verse 19 in Lystra. Acts chapter 17, verse 5 in Thessalonica, Thessalonica okay? Because they rejected Jesus, they put him on the cross, and now they are going after the followers, okay? And it's tragic to think about how these early Christians were persecuted by the Jews. Now listen, it's also tragic to think how so-called Christians have persecuted Jews throughout the years. I don't want to make, I don't want to, you know, uh, say that that's not true, true either. They're both true, and neither one of them should happen, okay? And then in verse 9, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Very interesting word here for poverty. It's the word tokos in the Greek, tokos. It means you have absolutely nothing. You know, what's, what's poverty in the United States today? I don't know, you don't have a BMW or a flat screen TV and you don't live in a house that has three bathrooms. That's poverty, right? No, no, no. Tokos. You got nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're totally destitute. You have nothing. I emphasize this because this is the same word that is used in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor, tokos, in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? We have no spiritual assets. That goes back to being born into this world spiritually cut off from God. This goes back to Jesus saying you have to be born again. See, it's all wound up in the same idea. We're born into this world. We have absolutely no spiritual assets. We have to depend on God for everything. So, in Smyrna, these Christians who were probably slaves, okay, probably got nothing for the work that they did. If they ever had any property, it was probably long confiscated from them. They were, they were poor, but because of their faith, they were rich. You see, this church had every reason to fail. This church had every reason to be destroyed, okay? But what did they do? They leaned on the Lord Jesus Christ even more. And as I said at the beginning of this message, the phonies are weeded out, okay? The best way to weed out fake Christians is to have a persecuted church because they're not going to hang around very long for that. And so the Lord says, I know at the beginning of verse 9, I know what you're going through. I've been poor. I've had no place to put my head, okay? I've been persecuted. I know what you're going through. You know how you hear, you, you hear these politicians, right, you know, during the campaign, oh, I feel your pain. They don't feel nothing. They're all wealthy and rich, and then they fly off somewhere for a vacation, right? They don't know your pain at all. That's a bunch of baloney. Jesus Christ is your sympathetic high priest. Jesus Christ knows exactly what you're going through. And that's what he's saying here to this persecuted church, okay? And then he says, but you are rich. How can they be rich? Because they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why they're rich. Because they have spiritual assets. See, this is a poor, rich church. Laodicea that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks is a rich, poor church. You understand the difference? Okay. This is a poor, rich church, okay? They have divine resources. They have true friends, the sympathetic Savior, okay? And that's, and that's what is going on here. That's why the Lord says that they are rich. They have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at the, look at the command. Again, there's no condemnation. Usually at this point, I talk about a condemnation. There's no condemnation. Let's go to the command. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. All right, number one, what is the most often command, most frequent command in the whole Bible? Do not be afraid. Here it is again. Do not be afraid. Okay? Do not be afraid, Christ tells them. All right? I've been there before. I've done that. And then he tells them not only what's going to happen, but why it's going to happen. I tell you, some, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Okay? And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Let me just mention, there's all sorts of commentaries about the 10 days. It means 10 years. It means a very long time. Listen, it means 10 days. Okay? If you wanted to say 10 years, you would have said 10 years. They're going to be put in prison for a short time. They may get out of prison through death. Okay? That, that may be how they get out of prison. All right? They may just be released. But it's a short imprisonment. But what I want to focus on here is why. Why are they being put in prison? Notice what it says. Satan is doing this, what? To test you. Now, folks, listen, you should all, you know, beginning of the year, you should all realize Satan has one goal in mind for 2013 for you and your family. You know what it is? Complete and utter destruction. 
He wants you divorced. He wants you at the throats of your children. He wants the children at the throats of their parents, okay? He wants us completely destroyed. You should know that that's coming, okay? Second Timothy. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, okay? So, how do we pass this test? Here's the key. Here's the key. We have to turn over all of our suffering to Jesus Christ. That's how you get through suffering. You have to suffer in Christ. Okay, now you're all going, okay, all right, you know. Let's just think about this, okay? I know I'm pressed for time, but I'm sorry about that, all right? Listen, okay? Let's say you get a, a bad medical report. Let's say a, a loved one gets sick. Maybe they die. L let's say you lose your job. That's, that's pretty, pretty frequent in our economy today. You lose your job, okay? Let's say you have a bad relationship with a child or a parent, whatever the case may be, okay? You and your family are suffering. Now look, it might not be directly related to being a Christian. It was in Smyrna, okay, fine, okay? But it, it might not be directly related to being a Christian. I'm not going to get into how Satan can influence our physical health and our relationships. That's another sermon, okay? All right? But it doesn't matter no matter what kind of suffering you are going through, and no matter what the reason is that you are going through it, you can always turn it over to Christ. How do you do that? Here's how you do that. In the midst of your suffering, you are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of your suffering, you are a good example of how a Christian goes through suffering. Do you understand that? No matter what the problem is, if you go through that as a Christian would go through it, and I have to give you a passage here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So no matter what you are going through, just imagine this, okay? You're in an office, everybody knows you, you know everybody else, and some tragedy happens to your family, whatever that might be. And instead of being mean and rotten and giving up on life and becoming an alcoholic and going to all of this dependency and being nasty and playing the victim and this and that and the other thing, you come in there and you go, hey, you know what, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, I still have inner joy and peace because I know where my Christian loved one is. They're in the presence of the Lord right now, okay? And I'm going to continue to do my work and I'm going to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a... What kind of a witness is that going to be for everybody who sees you? Do you understand that? That's how you turn any type of suffering over to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Whether it's directly related to you being a Christian or not, you can make it directly related to you being a Christian by how you handle that. That's what we're supposed to learn from this this morning. Okay? I don't know what 2013 is going to have for us. Okay? But whatever it has for us, it doesn't really matter. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you'll die. Maybe I'll die. I know where I'm going. I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay? So, so, so what the Lord is saying here is, be faithful to me. That's the point that he's trying to make here, okay? Now, I'm going to skip here a little bit because I want to finish here. The counsel. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who is in, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Okay? So if your fate, look, listen to this. We're all going to die someday. You can either die faithfully or unfaithfully. If you die faithfully, what do you get? You get eternal life. That's the crown of life. What's the second death? The first death is physical life. The second death is spirit. The first death is physical death. The second death is spiritual death. If you die faithfully in Jesus Christ, you're going to die physically, but you're not going to die again. You're not going to die spiritually. You're not going to be separated from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Do you understand that? And then at the end, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear. You find that at the end of every one of these letters. It means listen to what the Lord is saying.